For this talk, I'm going to concentrate on surface transport, not aviation or shipping. Happy to discuss other issues in the Q&A. My approach is going to be to try to provide a big picture, radical themes and opportunities that I think we should collectively push in the National Policy Forum submissions as a membership base. Having sat on the other side of the fence where the NPF ideas are arriving, I can say that the valuable role of the NPF is not to get into the detail, for example, how to get a few more bikes onto trains, much as that would be good, but to push for radical things and make valuable argument space for the leadership to do the right thing. For that, what is needed is a coherent, strong and loud NPF voice. So the following <laughs> that I'm going to go into is trying to pull out what I think are the 10 big themes. So number one, it is vital that transport policy is founded in recognition of um, the climate emergency and is founded on carbon budgets. Transport is the rogue sector with the worst record on emissions. If the election had gone the other way, <clears throat> I can assure you, Labour, and McDonald would have put carbon budgets at the foundation of transport policy. Amongst other matters, that means, crucially, abolishing the present Department for Transport spending priority of spending £90 billion on building new roads by 2035. That will increase traffic and emissions in exactly the crucial period they need to go down in order to save the climate. Instead, we should spend the money on public transport and provision for safe travel using bicycles and on foot. Number two, secondly, we have to recognise that electric cars are not enough. Even with the most wildly optimistic scenarios for uptake of electric vehicles, we need to reduce car use substantially and get people to make their journeys by other means. Climate targets actually require less car use by a minimum of 20% and possibly up to 60%. This means a huge change in thinking. Then I'm going to outline what I see as the key elements of that thinking. Then I'll say a little bit more about each one. So number three, we need to recognize a universal basic right to excellent public transport and walking and cycling facilities. Fourth, we need to set guaranteed public service standards for places everywhere according to their size something that's done already in parts of switzerland number five in turn to implement that it is essential that we re-regulate buses and take ownership of more buses and trains number six for it all to fit together as a single system so that people can get easily from any place to any other place we need what might, call, what might be called a, a total timetable approach, covering the whole country and all modes of transport, all modes of public transport. Also something that Switzerland does, so perhaps it's best called a, a Swiss-style timetable. Seven, we should have free public transport, at least in some places and for some people. Number eight, there should be an eco-levy on driving, at least where there is free public transport. Number nine, we must exploit new sources of funding for public transport and walking and cycling as used in other countries. And number 10, all of this is in the context of switching spending to, alive, to align with carbon budgets for transport, which, as I've already said, means totally abolishing the Tories' plans to spend £90 billion wasting money building roads and instead spend it on sustainable transport. So, that's 10 points, just to put a bit more flesh on those bones and there's limited time but at transport for quality of life we believe there should be a universal basic right to live well without recourse to a car and that in turn means a universal basic right to excellent public transport and to excellent provision for making trips on foot or on a bike this may sound radical and it certainly needs to be if we're going to meet the climate emergency in which transport is as i said the rogue sector the worst performing but in fact it is doable and some countries are actually already doing some of what is needed. So let's look at a few of the more encouraging examples, starting with public transport, then moving on to walking and cycling. A universal basic right to excellent public transport means services that are sufficiently comprehensive, that is a feasible, indeed an attractive option, more attractive than the car, to make journeys from pretty much any place A to any place B by public transport. Where's that true at the moment? Well, in various parts of Northern Europe, there are transport associations, and in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, where these exist, Verkehrsverbund is the German name, and they do a pretty good job of it. These transport associations cover areas that are bigger than the so-called combined authorities in England, 
many of them with much more rural areas included, but they managed to achieve levels of public transport use per capita per person that are two or three or four times those in our combined authorities. If Britain's urban areas were to achieve the same levels of public transport use, we would be cutting carbon emissions from cars by something like nine or ten percent. A huge and hugely important step when you consider transport emissions haven't fallen significantly from 1990 levels. A universal basic right to public transport implies underpinning that by legally guaranteed levels of service. This is already the approach in parts of Switzerland. So let's look at the situation in Zurich Canton, some parts of which are actually quite rural. So there's a tiny place, picking one at random, called Berg am Eichel, has only 500 inhabitants, but it is guaranteed, like every settlement in the Canton, of over 300 people, an hourly service. In fact, it gets two services per hour. It gets buses from 6 a.m. in the morning until just before midnight, every day of the week, including Sundays. The bus services go to the nearest train line and they connect. Yes, they really do connect, remember that concept? <laughs> buses at rural stations arrive three minutes before the trains and they leave after, how sensible. And they connect with trains going to the nearest large place, in this case, Winterthur, and then to Zurich. We need this sort of approach. We also need to do what the Swiss do and establish a national timetable based on the rail timetable. So the reach of the railway, as you might call it, into its rural hinterland is massively increased. In fact, the timetable in Switzerland is so important, the national timetable, it goes to the cabinet for its final approval. So how do these countries do so much better than us? Well, of course, they have regulated systems where bus companies are regulated. No other country would dream of being as stupid as we've been since Margaret Thatcher when she stopped local authorities determining what buses were needed where. Indeed, most of the Verkehrsverbund, the transport associations, they not only regulate the bus services, but they own and run their bus services, plus trams and trains as often as not. We should do the same. That means that all the services from buses, trams, tubes, trains work together. In Munich, Transport Association, they have a splendid simple motto, one network, one timetable, one ticket. Super sensible, sounds easy, doesn't it? We can't do it. We don't have a hope of doing that with our rival, mutually hostile private bus companies doing what they like. So if we want to make the business case for a new tram, it's undermined because private bus companies like to run against it in competition with it rather than feed into it. That's what used to happen with the Newcastle Metro, but was destroyed by Margaret Thatcher's 1985-1986 bus deregulation and privatization. Bus deregulation is one of the biggest and most underappreciated reasons Britain lags the rest of the world, or the rest of Europe particularly, uh, in installing modern tram, tram systems. Taking ownership of buses, in fact, would be a very easy step now because we, <coughs> we've got to a situation where, from where before coronavirus, over 40% of bus industry revenues anyway came from public money. They came from reimbursement for all people's bus use. They came from a thing called the Bus Service Operating Grant and directly supported non-commercial services that local authorities tried to fill gaps in the network with. Now the lion's share is in the public first. It is being paid for by the public. So for that, we should be getting majority shares of bus ownership and switching the whole of the country to the London-style franchising, from which it is a very easy step to switch each route to be run by 100% publicly owned operators as soon as we have those. So in this respect, COVID-19 is a really big opportunity. And if you go for this level of investment in quality, what is the quid pro quo? Well, we should say, we should incentivize people to switch from driving by applying eco levies on driving. And we say do that first in the urban areas and link it with what is happening now in more than a hundred cities around the world, making public transport fare free. Dunkirk implemented free public transport for its buses. That's what they have there last year. It's seen bus use increase, increase 85%, nearly double. And encouragingly, half of the new users are switching from cars. Interesting that Dunkirk did this not for environmental reasons, but actually for economic reasons, to boost the city's economy. And this has, I think, lessons for a lot of our ailing towns. Doncaster might be one of them, Tosh. Um, better provision for people walking and using bikes is essential. We think the potential for cutting emissions is much underestimated. It is estimated by modeling that if we had the same culture of cycling, the same quality of infrastructure as the Dutch, and the similar support for electrically assisted bikes, 
we would be cutting about 30% of emissions from cars. And that, I should say, does allow for the added hilliness of Britain. I should also point out that the Dutch haven't always had a cycling culture. They did lose it. It was only after good campaigning they got it back. Instead of investing, as the Tories plan, in building lots of new roads that destroy open countryside and that will increase traffic, we should do what Copenhagen's doing, building really good segregated cycle routes along their trunk, alongside their trunk road routes. If you plot the Copenhagen routes onto a map of London, they extend to beyond St Albans and Potter's Bar, and they're replacing long car commutes. The average bike trip on those routes is 15 kilometres. As it happens, with COVID-19, we're beginning to see major road space reallocation from vehicles to walking and cycling on major roads. Unheard of before. Completely unheard of. It is vital that we retain this temporary allocation on a permanent basis. We're getting at the moment a vision of the future we need to save the climate, to have clean air in our towns and cities, to get rid of our traffic noise in our urban areas, and to all have the means to travel safely and healthily. Labour has to endorse this and say it will make it permanent. And to do all of this, we need not just an eco levy on driving to fund it, we need to recognise that our transport system should be supported by money from a lot of organisations and people who do benefit from it, but don't pay for it in the same way as they do in other countries. That is the rationale behind the so-called versant transport, a payroll levy used in France, completely responsible for the renaissance in trams in France. That means that employers support the transport system that delivers their employees to their doors. And Another thing would be the visitor taxes that are used to support public transport spending in many countries. Britain needs something similar to both of these things, and these speak also to giving much greater fundraising powers to devolved authorities and, um, and uh, local authorities. Um, I'm nearly finished, but I'd like to ask our technical guru, Peter, to put up a diagram that summarises this, and if all goes according to plan, it will just um, put some things together. <clears throat> Okay, well, I'm sorry this looks a bit intimidating, but it's very much what I've just been uh, running through. The climate emergency is the foundation of transport policy. This is what I hope we can all reflect in submissions to the National Policy Forum. Coming down the right-hand side there, a universal basic right to public transport, and that follows the need for Swiss-style service standards everywhere, and from that follows the need to regulate and incentivize public ownership and investment. From that... Uh, or, or complementary to that is getting a national style Britain wide timetable and coming down the left hand side if you're going to make the climate emergency your foundation you must have carbon budgets and then you must bring your financial budgets in line with that and John McDonnell would have done this as a Chancellor of the Exchequer if he'd had the chance um, that means you kill the road building budget you divert it to sustainable modes you bring in money from other sources you have a massive transformative investment and then you bring in, yes, some eco levies that incentivize not driving and you use that money and other monies to implement fair free public transport where it makes sense. That's been a very quick run through, um, but uh, thank you for your time and your attention, everyone. That was, uh, that was uh, absolutely amazing, Ian, absolutely amazing. I know that we've got a number of people that are saying this is, this is actually inspirational and they want to know where they can get more um where they can get a copy or more information about what you've just presented and i think we've answered that in the in in the question and answer if you go to uh the website for the cosmos we're going to be posting all of these um presentations there and ian's uh, wonderful presentation that he went through just now will hopefully be there too um, but that was a tremendous uh, outline of the importance of how we can move transport really towards uh, meeting that um, green um, um, uh, uh, um, sort of climate um, addressing that the, the sort of the climate um, it, 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 um, it, it, the climate emergency that we all face and how we can move transport towards that and address that. Um, I just want to uh, maybe take, I've got to think, I think we've got uh, one or two questions that we could probably take just before we bring in um, uh, our next speaker. Um, I think uh, actually, no, what I'll do is I'll, I'll go straight to our next speaker and then I'll, no, because I know Ian, you're leaving. So this is why I'm going to bring in some questions because I know that you've you've got to leave us so I just want to sort of um, look at one or two questions that might be um, useful for you to answer Ian um, 
Um, so we've got a question here from Carmen. Let me see if I've, I've understood this question correctly. But Carmen says, and this is directly for Ian, why instead of taxation uh, that wealthy in individuals uh, simply would pay, why rather than taxation, no, uh, and, and rather than introduce a limit to how many miles each individual can travel using private transport by road, wealthy individuals then would be forced to buy miles from those that, that don't use it. Is that a question, Ian, you can um, possibly look at for us? This comes back to the uh, debate as to whether you should have an individual sort of allowance of carbon um, and uh, that that should apply equally to everyone. And uh, there are a lot of good arguments for that. Um, and people like Mayor Hillman have been advocating this for many, many years. And I think, you know, if you do go with systems of eco levies to pay for <clears throat> um, so you have to pay per mile for driving so they see the cost of it there you know in fact that is not incompatible with going with a system where you have individual carbon budgets and allowances uh, the, the question from Carmen was actually proposing that these be tradable and people can pay for them and that sort of thing of course in a way the most equitable system is just that you do have absolute rations and that's it however rich you are that's your limit on how much <laughs> carbon you can burn <laughs> There's arguments in both directions there, but no, I would be in favour of that sort of thing. And to pick up another question, I noticed that there were people, mm. there's someone who's asked a question about um, the uh, HS2, which I haven't tackled, but let's uh, tackle that. Um, I, uh, if, if Andy had, had been Chairman Secretary of State for Transport, he would have supported um, getting high-speed rail, but he would have um, wanted to see the specifications change and the way it's done change. Uh, I mean, I see it as one of the things that... Um, is in the longer run something which can challenge domestic aviation um, and it's important in that role. That means in fact making sure that it does reach Scotland, it does get to Glasgow and Edinburgh and uh, provide these. I mean the, the evidence is that if from around the world if you can get city centre, city centre links and HS2 should do city centre, city centre not be in that way, then you can kill the aviation flight um, market over the same distance, you know, just flights of two to three uh, well, the equivalent to train journeys on H high speed is two to three hours. Uh, and I can see that there's a question coming up saying, well, Switzerland's different. It's rural areas of Switzerland. Uh, I would beg to differ with that, actually. Um, although I'm happening to be part of this conversation from one of the most rural counties in Britain, in, in Powys, where I've lived for 20 years without a car, <laughs> excuse me, the, um, up a hill in Powys, um, actually, the vast majority of certainly England is um, if not only lightly rural, it's not deep rural, and a lot of it actually is sort of dormitory to the nearest regional area and is what you might call peri-urban. I think we need to be careful about not defining the problem so it's impossible. So urban rural is a, a gross simplification. There's a vast sort of area in between uh, people living in suburbs and peri-urban areas which in fact are very amenable to the sort of approach that Switzerland is, is talking about and then there's people saying well you can't do it by buses uh, you've got to bring in you've got to you, you know what about like opening new railway stations I'm all in favor of that but actually what I was talking about about the way that you extend the reach of the railway by making sure that you've got a timetable that extends right across the buses so things actually connect a concept that we've lost is vital to that if you're going to make the case for new railway lines build it on the sort of model that I was laying out because that is where you'll get your value for money. That's, you know, the reach of the railway in Switzerland into its rural hinterland by having these connections and a national timetable and publicly owned operators. It's hugely more than our, our railway where it doesn't connect with buses. The train operators don't even agree with each other where they're going <laughs> to have transfers. So trying to pick up a few of the questions there, but they'll keep on coming, I'm afraid. Okay. So. Um uh, thanks for that. Do you, have, do you have time for one or two more of those questions? Yeah. Um, do you want to get, there's one. There's one here just about um, can we encourage the car-free cities movement uh, alongside development of public transport? Um, but they. But you know, can we wait for a Labour government to make these major changes? I guess it's you know, what can we do now? Yeah. Do you want to 
<clears throat> I think this actually links very well to the situation with the coronavirus because I, I think if one thing it is showing is that things that people had assumed were impossible are in fact possible and we're not getting um, full car free cities which would be um, good but we're getting parts of that and I think there's there's a there's a richness uh, of urban environment that people are beginning to experience again you know um, and we're showing that culture can be changed car free cities movement fantastic um, we get bits of that Regent Street gets shut from now and now again in London there's you know, you know we've seen some people have seen anyway the, the um, situation in Paris where certain days uh, have become car free and this sort of thing there's there's I think getting people to experience these things and get in there and, and support it is, is is crucially important I mean I, I know from sitting in Andy McDonald's office that um, the the kind of motoring lobby bogeyman is is huge with all with all politicians ever since the year 2000 um, uh, with the fuel protests and it is for us as the membership to say look actually there's a very vocal lobby there but there's a whole load of us who actually see it differently you know the, the and, and the statistics are interesting about drivers one of my colleagues at transport for quality of life did some of the pioneering research on what drivers actually think and if you go and ask drivers the interesting thing is that there's only about a quarter of them that are what you could call die-hard drivers the jeremy Clark clarksons of this world um there's about half of drivers would rather not be driving and that is a perspective that most politicians have not been accustomed to because all they hear from is the, the vocal minority. And it's for us to put these other perspectives about the value of car-free cities. It's a good question to ask. Thank you.